the organizers for inviting me here and giving me the possibility to speak to this large audience. Uh, so today uh, I would like to discuss about the Kobayashi conjecture. Uh, which was stated by Kobayashi in the 70s, so maybe 1970. Uh, so you take X to be a general hypersurface in complex projective space. So X is n dimensional here of degree D. And you take it to be general uh, in the sense that the space of coefficients lies in, in the Zariski open set of the Projective space of parameters. Uh, then, if d is larger than some bound dn, depending only on dimension, then x uh, should be Kobayashi hyperbolic. Uh, it is well known by body that uh, this is equivalent to the non-existence of entire curves. So there does not exist any non-constant entire curve uh, from C into X here. Okay, so this, this is now a theorem. Uh, so in fact, uh, well, Sue around uh, 2002 started uh, producing some strategy and uh, so the main strategy is to use uh, jet differentials. Well, this was already introduced uh, much earlier by many people already from the block, uh, block theorem. Uh, and then use vector fields. So we yeah, you introduced many techniques. So this was in the Abel conference in 2002. Uh, but then uh, details were extremely complicated and he proposed uh, calculations of jet differentials that were hard to follow. So there's an, another paper uh, which was on archive in 2012 and that ultimately was published uh, in Inventiones 2015 where he gives more details about the strategy but the proof is still very long and complicated. Okay. So um, the first proof that I really understand was given by Damien Brodbeck. Uh, Uh, 2016, uh, but with a non-effective value of dn. So the existence of dn was proved, but uh, dn non-effective. Well, not yet effective. And then my PhD student, uh, Deng Ya, uh, Ya Deng, in Occidental order. Uh, so in his PhD thesis, uh, well, a few weeks after publication of a paper by Damien, uh, obtained actually added uh, the effective uh, considerations that led to an explicit value. And he got something like uh, n to the 3n plus 7, or something like this. But then the proof was still, uh, proof based on uh, Damien Brodbeck's work is still, still complicated uh, with a lot of arguments. 
And today I would like to concentrate on a, actually a much simpler proof. So a much simplified technology that gives also better bounds. <coughs> so this is the main subject of my talk, is to explain simplification and improvement of the technology, still not optimal. So my goal, goal is a sim much simpler proof. which also yields better estimates, but still far from the expectations. So uh, now we get dn, well, equal to, well, essentially something like the integral part of en to the 2n plus 2 divided by 5. Okay, it was still large, uh, and the expectation for the optimal value. Well, the expectation comes from uh, the well-known facts from uh, algebraic geometry. So instead, instead of proving Kobayashi hyperbolicity, you prove a weaker algebraic property. which is purely algebraic, which tells you that if you take any algebraic subvariety y of x, then it is of general type, okay? Positive dimension, uh, possibly uh, singular, uh, then uh, y should be of general type. And then, essentially, uh, for x uh, general, uh, this property is satisfied, but for a much lower value of, of dn. So then, for this property, on the known values of dn are, well, very simple case, of course, is n is 1. So then uh, you are in P2 and you take a, a curve of degree at least 4, uh, and then it will be hyperbolic, okay? So D1 is 4. A cubic, of course, an elliptic curve, so it doesn't work. For n equal 2, 3, and 4, uh, value of dn is uh, 2n plus 1. For, for the algebraic property, okay? And for n at least 5, uh, dn equal 2n works. Uh, this was obtained uh, in the series of many works by uh, Clemens, Ein, and Claire Voisin, essentially obtaining this value 2n plus 1. And then the, the uh, value 2n was obtained by uh, Pacenza. And now the expectation is that this, these bounds are also valid for the Kobayashi conjecture. And the reason, the reason why this value should also hold for Kobayashi hyperbolicity is this fantastic conjecture, which is called the green griffiths line conjecture. which somehow is the conjecture that relates the analytic expectations with the algebraic properties. So it's a very general conjecture. It says that if x is a projective algebraic manifold over C of general type, Uh, then there should exist a proper algebraic subvariety uh, containing all the entire curves. Non constant.
of course, this, this is a property that is birationally invariant. So you can, it's equivalent to a statement uh, for, for also for x singular, if you wish, because it's birationally invariant. And then if you apply inductively on dimension the gunn griffiths lang conjecture, uh, it will show very easily that if you know uh, the algebraic statement that you cannot see here, Okay, so this uh, this statement will imply the Kobayashi conjecture. Okay, so so Green Griffiths Lang, Green Griffiths Lang plus the known algebraic property, uh, known algebraic statement above, implies the Kobayashi conjecture. However, uh, we are still very far from understanding the Green Griffiths Lang conjecture, although uh, there is progress on that. Uh, but we are still very far, and therefore uh, we look for an independent proof of the Kobayashi conjecture uh, using uh, current technology. So now I'm going to enter into the uh, precisely how you can uh, reach the analytic statements. So maybe for algebraic geometry, it's not so exciting to to do something that gives uh, much weaker bounds, but of course the expectation is that the analytic technology also will be useful to get arithmetic statements. Because uh, we do expect, and uh, this was emphasized by, by Long, that uh, in the case uh, you have this hyperbolicity <laughs> property, you have analogs of, say, the, the Felt, uh, Mording, Mordell Felting's uh, result on uh, arithmetic points, uh, it is expected that the analytic tools will give you some, um, some input on the existence of rational points and things like that. Okay, so it's not just a matter of what are the bounds, it's also a matter of what is the av available technology and what you can do with this technology. So now I, I want to discuss precisely these tools and, uh, and show uh, the recent progress about it. Okay, so now I'm going to the, the technology. Okay, so we consider the category of directed manifolds. Or varieties, if you want. At this point, everything can be singular. So it's just a, the objects, the objects are pairs. where x, say, is an algebraic variety, and v is a sub-bundle or sub-sheaf of the tangent sheaf. You may allow singularities here, if you want. And then the, the morphisms, morphisms, say, uh, capital phi, are just algebraic morphisms from x to y, such that uh, the differential of phi maps uh, v into w. So it looks like a very simple category. You can also consider, um, if you want, rational morphisms, not, not just uh, morphisms. <coughs> And then a very important object uh, in this category is the sample tower. So you get actually a sequence of directed varieties. For K, uh, any non-negative integer. Uh, it's constructed inductive, so it's a tower. So you have a sequence of morphisms down to x0. x0 is the same as x, and v0 is the same as v, okay? So the, the bottom of the tower is the original uh, directed variety. And then it's constructed inductively 
by taking xk to be uh, the projectivization of uh, the vk minus 1 that you have here. Okay? So you take p of vk minus 1, where this p means the productive space of lines. So it's, so it's not Gotendieck's notation, so it's not no, hyperplanes, it's lines. Okay, you take lines. And once you are here, you want to define what is VK. So now I'm going to tell you how you define VK at this stage. So of course, well, assume that everything is smooth at this point. So assume that X is non-singular and assume that uh, V is, say, a sub-bundle to, to make things simple. Uh, then uh, everything will be non-singular. And then, of course, you have the relative uh, exact sequence. Of uh, xk over xk minus 1. It's just uh, a bundle in productive spaces. Suppose you denote by pi k here the projection. But of course here, by assumption, you have a directed structure. So uh, you have here the sub-bundle vk minus 1, or pi, pi, pi k star here. But here in, in uh, pi k star of vk minus 1, you have the O of minus 1 bundle of the construction. Okay. So here, this contains the tautological O minus 1. When you, you projectivize a bundle, you have a tautological O of 1 bundle, or O minus 1 bundle. And the O minus 1 here is contained in the pullback of that one. I denoted by OXK of minus 1, okay? And now you just simply take the pullback of this. Uh, so it's the sub-bundle of the tangent bundle of XK that projects to the tautological line here. Okay, so I, I have two, two steps here, and you define this to be VK. And then, of course, the kernel, again, is the relative tangent space. And that's the definition of the sample tower. Now, it turns out that the, the sample tower is completely functorial. So if you have a morphism uh, from xv to yw, you have at each level a morphism from the k stage of the sample tower of xv into the sample tower of uh, of YW, okay? so it's functorial. So at this point, it's maybe unclear to you uh, what is what is the definition in the singular case? But this functoriality makes it very easy to extend to the singular case because you proceed that way. Uh, of course, because you have a coherent sheaf, uh, it will be a, actually a vector bundle on the Zariski open set. Okay, so uh, you take x prime in x. So assume now you are in the singular case. You take x prime to be the Zariski open set, where uh, so Zariski open set, where uh, so you, it's, so v restriction to x prime is actually a sub bundle 
of Tx prime. And you assume, of course, that x prime is contained in, this, uh, in the open set of regular points of, of x. Now, uh, you can, by the smooth situation, you can do whatever you like. Oops, okay, that's the first one. No. Also, this construction is local. The construction is local, so you can locally embed. So embed <coughs> locally, say a germ, germ of x, uh, into uh, say uh, some uh, some smooth ambient space. Um, well, do it analytically, for instance. Okay, as an open set in CN. Well, let me call this smooth domain omega. And of course, the V now is uh, contained in the tangent space to omega, which of course, if you are in CN, is just a trivial tangent bundle. Okay, which I take this to be my, my W. And then, of course, I get an algebraic morphism from x prime v prime, uh, it's embedded into omega w. And now I can construct the sample tower here, but here it's completely non-singular because I'm in a smooth ambient variety. And I'm just defining, so you, by functoriality, you can define this on the Zariski open set where you have no trouble. And you simply take the closure so I'm going to define, by definition, you take the Zariski closure. You have to show that, uh, actually, you can take the Zariski closure into uh, this uh, ambient smooth sample tower. OK, so there is no trouble to extend all these objects. I will not give more details about that. But all the objects that you construct that way by functoriality can easily uh, be extended to arbitrary singularities. So you, you, you're assuming in a singular case that V is a saturated subgeometry. Otherwise, no, actually, qualify it on, on the singularities only. Actually, uh, what is relevant here is not V viewed as a sheaf, but viewed as a linear space. Uh, so it's the dual thing. Uh, the sheaf is not really relevant. What you are interested in is rather the, s the set of points satisfying the equations coming from the dual sheaf. Okay, so it's, uh, the, the sheaf of sections is not relevant. Uh, to make things more precise, if you take the Euler vector field, for instance, so you are just here, the, the ambient variety is just Cn, okay? And then you take V to be a rank one, and given simply by the Euler vector field. Okay, if you, if you view that as a sheaf, of course the sheaf consists of, of uh, objects that suddenly vanish at the origin because the generator is the Euler vector field. But one is interested rather in curves that are tangent curves or integral curves of this distribution. But then of course you have all the lines going through zero and you have a lot of curves that are simply lines going through zero with non-zero non derivative here. So what you are interested in is the V that actually the full CN at zero. So, so it's, it's the dual thing that is interesting and not, not, not the sheaf itself. Okay, but I, I'm not going to enter into this. Okay. 
Okay, what, what's important is that if you have a curve, you have a functorial lifting. So given a germ of curve, By this, I mean a curve that is tangent to the distribution V. Okay? You can view your, your V as a distribution of sub, subspaces of the tangent bundle. Okay? So at each point, you have Vz here, you have a distribution. And then you are looking at integral curves of this. Okay? So you assume, you assume that uh, the differential of F, uh, the tangent space, the tangent line uh, belongs to, to V at every point. And then once you have a curve like this, of course you can lift it to the first stage. Simply, uh, you define the first jet. Well, it's given by the base point, which is f of t. And then you take the tangent line, of course. If you take the tangent line, and even if it's a, a, a stationary point of the curve, there will be a tangent line. And this defines a point in P of V, which is simply x1. Okay, and then you can iterate this construction, and then you can lift your curve, so you can define uh, inductively Fk, which will be the projectivized k-jet of your curve. Okay, so inductively, so you get inductively, uh, one gets, Fk, which will be a germ of curve to the, uh, the k stage of the sample tower. Okay, now something extremely important, of course, are these uh, tautological line bundles, Oxk of 1. Uh, it's uh, very important to identify what are the direct images? So you have, you have projections. So I denote by pi kl the projection from xk to xl, which is composition of the successive uh, steps of the tower for l less than k. And now uh, it's important to identify Classical associated uh, curves, the curving projective spacer from the oscillating planes. Yeah, is it the same? Yeah, essentially yes. So, um, of course, you have the usual k jet when you have um, a curve. You can consider its k jet. So mm, you take the Taylor expansion. Okay. And then if you neglect the higher coefficients, you get the k-jet. And you identify, uh, you say the k-jets are equal if the, you have the same coefficients up to a derivative of the k. But here, you look at unparametrized curve. So the, the first jet, you are not interested in the value of c1, but only uh, in the point in productive space, so only at the tangent, okay? And if you go the higher order, it means actually that you consider unparametrized curves, so you take curves modulo the action of reparametrizations. So you reparametrize here your parameter t by taking something uh, which is actually in, the, in a group, a non-reductive group, which is the group of uh, k-jets of binomorphisms of CID origin. Okay, so it's the group. Which I denote by GK, it's a group of changes of parameters, k jets, uh, 
k was a1 non-zero, so that is local bilomorphism. It's a local bilomorphism of c at the origin. And what you are interested in somehow are the un unparametrized curves. So you, you, you consider the curves to be equivalent if uh, they gave the same geometric set but uh, parametrized in a different way. So somehow uh, this sample tower represents in some sense a compact, I will not have a time to explain that, but it's a compactification of the GIT quotient of uh, the usual k sets modulo uh, the action of GK. The difficulty with the GIT here is that it's a non-reductive group, so you, you have a lot of trouble. But nevertheless, the functorial construction that I gave solves somehow the difficulty and solves this problem that you would have in GIT theory by the fact that it's a non-reductive group. Okay, but I don't want to enter into those details because I'm going to concentrate on a simple proof. Okay, so now, um, so now you want to identify the direct image. So this is something that I got long ago. Actually, very simple fact. Uh, if you take the direct image of the tautological line bundles that you get by the projective construction, okay, so it's the tautological line bundles on the XK level, then uh, this can be viewed. I denote this usually by EKM V star. Uh, it's contained in a similar object that was constructed by Green and Griffiths. So I will define those two objects. So I have to define first the bigger one, the one by Green and Griffiths. So the Green Griffiths, Green Griffiths bundle consists of operators, differential operators, differential operators that act on germs of curves that you can write locally. As some, well, if you are in an analytic setting, you have some coefficients that depend at the point f where you are. And then uh, you have an algebraic oper operator in terms of the derivatives up to order k. You consider k jets, so you, you operate only on the first k derivatives. Okay, so you take some monomials, some monomials in terms of the derivative of f. Uh, derivative of f, of course, f is you write in local coordinates, so f itself is an n-tuple. And what I mean by this is a multi-index notation, so it's a monomial in the derivatives of the components of f in some coordinates. But now, if you are looking at unparametrized curves, unparametrized curves, uh, you want this operator to be independent of the parametrization. And then uh, the condition for EKM, so it's a sub-bundle. I have not yet defined what is M. And M is precisely given by what you get when you reparametrize. And what you want is that it depends only on the first derivative you should have this formula 
and m is the degree of the operator. <coughs> so let me give you a very simple example. And the simple example is the example of Vronskians. So if you take something like this, it will actually give you something which takes, uh, well, it's not scalar valued. It's, it's of total degree m equal kk plus one over two. Uh, it's with values, so it gives a section. So I will denote this by k prime. So it gives a section of a e k k prime of t star x, but it's with values in lambda k of t x. It's not it's not scalar valued. It's a it's a k vector here. Uh, if you uh, look at things, uh, this is independent of parametrization. Well, let's do it for two. Okay, so f prime which f double prime. So you compose. So if you change parameters, you will have this multiplied by five prime. And then for a second derivative, of course, it's just a chain rule. You take the derivative of this. So you have f double prime phi times phi prime square plus f prime phi phi double prime. So this thing looks wrong because you have the derivative of the parameter change which occurs. But now if you take the wedge product, the wedge product, this is killed by the first term. And then what gets out is phi prime to the cube. And phi prime to the cube is just the number of primes occurring in the operator. So the, uh, the degree of the operator actually is the total number of primes and total number of derivatives that occur in the formula. Um, well, these operators are precisely give uh, the direct image of my tautological line bundle. That's a crucial fact. And now the, the fundamental vanishing theorem that is very useful in this theory. was, well, somehow it goes back to Bloch uh, very long ago, but uh, then was fixed by Green Griffiths with still some gap in the proof. And then I also gave proof, now filling the gaps. Uh, it was also observed by Xu Young, <coughs> or essentially around 95. Uh, is that for every global anti-curve, and for every global differential operator, global one, x-projective, yeah. even in the green fist case, even for the bigger bundle, it's true. But it's also true for the directed case. But you have to take an operator with values in a negative bundle. So you, you need a minus one. Then automatically p of f is zero. In other words, it tells you that the the locus, the, the, the entire curves, the entire curves are solutions of differential equations. And those differential equations are all sections of, uh, 
of these uh, tautological bundles, twisted by a negative, so A ample here. So now this is the, the main thing. So I will not repeat the proof. As the proof now, there is a very simple proof of that now. Essentially, uh, Liouville theorem is enough. Now because of lack of time, I will skip the proof. And now to prove the Kobayashi conjecture in a very simple way, you are going to use uh, some sort of generalizations of these Vronskian operators. So I'm going to introduce generalized, generalized Vronskian operators. So it's extremely simple. In fact, you, you take an auxiliary line bundle. L over X, and suppose you take sections of that line bundle. So L usually will be ample. So you take L very ample, so you, you're sure you will have a lot of sections of L. But at this point, I don't need necessarily L to be ample. Okay, and now I'm going to define what I call the, the Vronskian associated to this section. So it's an operator that acts on curves. And you simply take the determinant of the derivatives of Sj composed with F for i and j between 0 and k. So you take as many derivatives as the number of sections here. Of course, the derivative of a section doesn't make sense, so you have to trivialize, you have to trivialize locally And then if you trivialize your bundle, you get a function. But then you have to check that because, because of the determinant, if you change the trivialization, actually you will get something intrinsic. And actually uh, what you get is something similar to this. And then um, you define this way a global. So then one gets that this Vronskian is a global section on X of this bundle that I have introduced, KK prime, well, of the full. It defines the full tangent space here. But, of course, you are taking a k plus 1, k plus 1 determinant with values in L. So you arrive not in scalars, but you arrive in L to the tensor k plus 1. Okay. Because in the determinant, you are, multi you are still multiplying things that are with values in L. So the output is in L tensor k plus 1. Okay, and now if you compare to the vanishing theorem, unfortunately, well, where is the vanishing theorem? Okay, in the vanishing theorem, you need something negative, which looks like impossible, because here you want sections, you want sections, so if you want a lot of sections, you need L to be rather positive. And then uh, your L k plus 1 will be even more positive. So it looks like you are not going to get anything useful. But it turns out that you, you may have simplifications. 
Okay, so that, that was observed already long ago by Nadel. So Nadel, or maybe Sue and others, uh, one may have some miracles, and uh, one may have simplifications in the Vronskians. So let's take a very uh, simple example. You take the Fermat, Fermat hypersurface. Okay, you take that one. And then, uh, well, you can view, of course, this as uh, section SJ of Z, which is just ZJ. Okay, that's a section uh, on PN of O of 1. Okay, and now you take K to be just uh, N minus 1. And just compute WK of S0, SK, which is SN minus 1. Okay, so this, this one, uh, sorry, to the, to the D, to the D. So now this one, of course, is with values in, uh, well, it's, uh, on Pn of this Ek, k prime, twisted by something very large. Uh, you have k, k plus 1 here. You have o, o of k plus 1 d. But you are computing, actually, you are computing a determinant of derivatives of this. You're actually computing this. But if D is extremely large, of course, the case derivative will contain it on each column. In each column of the determinant, this contains S0 to the D minus K. Because after you take K derivatives, you still have the D minus K power of each term. So this thing actually is divisible is divisible by S0 SK to the D minus K. After you take the division, after you take the division, Now you remove k plus 1 d minus k, so you are now in A0 pn e k k prime tensor, well, O of k plus 1 times d minus d minus k, which is k. Still positive. So it's three minutes, yeah, okay? Okay, I have two. I think I will not be able to explain all details, but um, okay, let me continue. So it doesn't, it doesn't work, of course, if you are in PN. But now, if you are, if you work on the Fermat hypersurface, which I denote by X, now you restrict, so you have a section here, so I call it sigma, now you restrict sigma to X. But when you restrict sigma to X, you find a linear combination, which is that the last section is minus Okay, maybe I put 0 here, and S1, rather, 
is n, the same, it's two. And now in, in your Vronskian, you are going to replace S0 by this combination. Of course, all those ones don't matter because it's a determinant. But then you are left with Sn to the d. So you find that this Vronskian is also divisible by Sn to d minus k. So it's also divisible. by Sn to the d minus k. And therefore, you gain, you gain a new divisibility. So you, then you divide by this. Then you get degree <coughs> OK plus 1 k minus d minus k. And now if d is large, you win. Because now you are in a negative line bundle, and you can apply vanishing theorem. So, unfortunately, uh, this is not enough. Uh, I'm to conclude. So now you have to, uh, it turns out that the Fermat equation is not good, but you have to modify by a more complicated equation. But this thing is not hyperbolic, by the way, it's well known. But you are going to take, so you, you take uh, actually a, a polynomial which is of the form sum of random polynomials. It's an idea of Damien Brodbeck. And here you take monomials which have a, lo a lot of common factors. And if you have a lot of common factors, you are going to, to get the simplification. So you have to devise an equation that provides a lot of Ronskians so it would be a sum, actually, a sum of, of some um, monomials. And then uh, you will obtain a lot more simplification in a lot of round scales. And then you get a lot of sections. So then you get a lot of round scales. And uh, by these round scales, you, you can compute generically their base locus. Uh, so you have a rather um, tricky uh, analysis of the base locus, but then you, it's completely computable. So you can compute the base locus. So you compute the base locus for generic choices of the, of the Q alphas. And then you get the Kobayashi uh, bound. And uh, the, the large degree is due to the fact that if you want a lot of simplifications, um, well, the polynomials that you can choose are rather complicated. <coughs> uh, at this point, I don't really understand the geometry. Um, well, the important conjecture that is left is the green griffiths conjecture. And uh, obviously, there are a lot of tools around this technology that could possibly lead to a proof. It's maybe reachable in these days, but... Uh, well, I will leave it that way at this point.